Hi, I'm Andrew. And I'm Angela. And welcome to the Musician's Toolbox. Here on this podcast, we talk to musicians in, and also not in the industry, um, on tips and tricks and things that they have learned uh, so that we can be successful too. We rely, we release podcast episodes um, every Friday, and we've talked about various topics, including how to be a better performer, stress management, time management, um, mental health, music production, and so many others. Um, and I think these tips that we talk about can be applicable for all musicians. We don't, um, mat- we don't care if you're a jazz musician or a classical musician or what age you are or if you're at college. Um, so we hope you really learn from these things that we talk uh, to these people about. And before we get started, um, we want to content or cater content to you. So if you have any suggestions or recommendations, uh, you can send us a DM or an email, or we also uh, accept voice messages, and all the links to that are in uh, the show notes down below. And today, we have a very exciting episode, and Angela is going to tell us about our guest. So today, we're joined by a colleague of mine. We actually did our graduate program at the same time. I believe you started before I did, but we were there for a while together because that's how graduate school goes. Um, (laughs) We we have with us Rachel Galvin. She has a doctorate in viola performance. She is also a Guild certified Feldenkrais method practitioner. It's a lot of words in there. I know. (laughs) Um, And then she also has certifications in USA weightlifting, functional movement systems, brand X method, and foundation training. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Rachel. Thank you for having me, Angela and Andrew. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, we're we're very excited excited that you're here. Mm -hmm. You um, have a very diverse background in comparison, not in comparison, but just it's something that we haven't had here yet. Very different. Um, You have a lot of athletic training and we need more of that (laughs) for musicians. So... (laughs) Um, could you start by telling us kind of about your journey, uh, maybe a couple pivotal moments that led mm-hmm. you to where you are now in your musical career? Yeah. So I, I am a pure violist. I started on viola at wow. the age of nine. I actually picked up violin when I was in high school because I was bored. Uh, <laughs> so I, I was. <laughs> So I played both and actually like you, Angela, like I fiddle too. Um, so uh, those, that's kind of my, my scope of practice, um, so to speak, in terms of music making. I actually also pick up, picked up singing in the last five years or so. So that's mm, been interesting. Nice. Cool. Um, but I, I started experiencing pain uh, related to playing my instrument, playing the viola when I was 16. Mm. Um, I went, or I was preparing for an all state audition and I, I had no idea how to practice and I loved playing the viola and I just kind of always just ran the piece over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And I spent so much time practicing and there was one morning I woke up, I went to pop my neck, you know, like in the kind of normal way that I would normally do it. But that morning, it was the day before the audition, my head just didn't go back up. <laughs> like, oh I felt this gosh. weird pop, there was pain and I could not hold my head up straight without pain. Oh my gosh. So then I went and I took the audition anyway, because wow. that's what I did. That's yeah. work ethic, right? Uh-huh. And I did okay. Like, I think I made an alternate or something like that. And, and I was like, oh, yeah. So this means that, like, if I play in pain, I can still be okay. I can still <laughs> no. do pretty well. <laughs> and uh. think about what it would be like if I weren't in pain. Like, I'd totally kick ass. <laughs> this is the message to myself right oh no <laughs> yeah and you know what they don't tell you is that like if you're playing in pain then there's going to be very rarely any times that you're not playing in pain mm-hmm. um so this kind of delusion that i had about well when i'm not in pain i'll be amazing um was <laughs> what it was it was a delusion mm-hmm. um, so so you know it took maybe two weeks for me to actually like be able to hold my head up right again um and i <laughs> I kind of left it there. I was like, okay, well, I'm fine now. I'm better now. Let's move on. 
-hmm. So I, I don't think I really had too many other problems in high school, but then I got into college. I was in a, a program in, in Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma, and we we didn't have, a, well, I mean, it, was, it was kind of a medium-sized viola studio, but I got roped into a lot of projects. Like mm -hmm. I was the composer, you know, the, the, they did, I did all the composition recitals and, you know, I, I had the principal chair and I just did all the things. Like you had a concert, it's good chance I was playing in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, it was just so much playing and so much not great, practice that I started to experience more and more injuries mm -hmm. to the point where I ended up taking a year off in the middle of my wow. undergrad. Um, so that actually delayed the, my finishing my degree. So I actually like took five years to do my bachelor's when well, people normally, I guess, take four. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was at, at that point, like I'd seen tons of doctors and, you know, specialists and acupuncturists and chiropractors and you name it. It's quite possible that I tried it. I was trying <laughs> massage and I was doing yoga and I was doing swimming and Pilates and like all the things <laughs> and none of it was really helping. And I, I wasn't getting the kinds of answers that I was hoping for, for from doctors. I was basically getting the either you need to stop playing altogether or this is just how it is. You need to step it up. <laughs> And as you can imagine, I was quite frustrated with those answers. <laughs> uh, so somewhere in the back of my mind, like I, I knew that, you know, I, this is not like a life or death kind of injury. So this is not, you know, like medical practice is kind of pushing me off. So, you know, I should be able to help myself. Hmm. And so I went and I got my first personal training certification after I finished my undergrad. Um, and I didn't do a huge amount with that. I was hoping to learn some things. I did. It was a good first step. Uh, for me. And then I went to grad school and I was still experiencing problems even all through grad school. And I picked up CrossFit when I was in grad school. And CrossFit was actually, for, for whatever reason, it was something that was helping me. Like it was helping me build the strength and the endurance that I felt like I needed. Uh, it was unfortunately only helping me to manage that pain. Mm -hmm. um, like it was kind of just keeping it stabilized. It wasn't actually helping me to flourish or feel like I, I always felt like I was at that tipping point, right? That precipice of like, I could either be injured or I could be fine. Mm -hmm. um, but it was always that teeter totter kind of unbalanced place. And, uh, and so it wasn't until after I finished my doctorate that I was just so fed up. I was like crying in a mattress store uh, because I had, told, I had told myself that if I could find a better pillow, then my neck would stop hurting. And so this poor woman at the, at the mattress store, she was so helpful. It was a great pillow. I paid like $200 for it, oh <laughs> thinking that like, this is the thing that will help me because, it's you know. Answer. Was it a purple answer. pillow? No, it was not a purple pillow. It had a funny contour to it. And it, actually, it was a really cool pillow. I still have that pillow. Uh, I would probably never throw it away. Uh, but, paid big bucks but, for that. You can't throw that away. I know, right? <laughs> Yeah, this, like, my son is going to inherit this pillow. Yeah. <laughs> it will get a name as well. <laughs> oh, fluffy. <laughs> anyway, but, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's, it's a ridiculous story. It's like, <laughs> you know, we're told that we should be able to just have these quick fixes. Like, here's, you know, some painkillers, go back to what you were doing. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, here's an arm brace or wrist brace, you know, wear this brace, you'll be fine. Or, you know, just here's a quick fix. Like I need, you know, that, that was in the moment. That's what I felt like I needed. I needed a pillow. And, you know, I ended up actually seeing a doctor again and them actually for the first time, I think it was 30 at this point, and them say, Hey, you know what, maybe we should do an MRI. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, that sounds great. I've actually never done that before. That's, that's interesting. Let's try this. And so then they came back and they said I had a herniated cervical disc and oh blah, my blah, blah. Gosh. So this was supposed to be like some kind of, you know, new information. Uh, and it was at this point where I'd finished my degree and I was pretty burned out on academia. <laughs> that, that I can I relate. Like, <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> uh huh. Yep. <laughs> that I was like, I need 
something new and I need something new on different levels here. So I went and I pursued CrossFit certifications. So I, you know, I did a CrossFit level one, a CrossFit level two, I did foundation training, FMS and all this stuff. And, and then I entered the Feldenkrais training. And so this was just my deep dive into fitness and wellness movement, uh, if you will. And that was really a, a big turning point in how mm. I viewed it just, it was a huge mindset change um, to how I viewed myself and my relationship to my body and my relationship with other people and what I thought about pain or what I knew about pain. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of, mm-hmm. I think, sums it up. To where yeah, now. that's, that's really interesting. And it's interesting how similar our paths were, even though I didn't know that. Um, I didn't, I actually had a similar like physical, needing a physical rebirth, (laughs) but mine happened during my academia, which much to my teacher's dismay, I was like, I am riding my bike this much time every week or I cannot (laughs) play the viola. So. Oh no, I remember that because I think, I think on the, on the other side, like I was having, yeah, I was having similar kinds of like disputes (laughs) Um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. where it's like no actually I need to I need to be like lifting weights right now that's what that's what I feel like I need to do like I remember yeah I I got a lecture because one of some (laughs) violists had like trip while running and broken his arm or something it was like in LA or somewhere it was like at the time it was you know like when we were in our grad school days got it and and that, that was like that was posed to me as like this could happen to you <laughs> no way <laughs> the irony of that is I fell almost every week when I was Whoa. training and like I had like gashes and yeah I still I have scars hmm. from the stuff but I never broke anything so wow. um the other thing that is interesting to me is um the I I hadn't thought about this before but what is it that makes us as musicians feel like we have to work so hard like, and I say that, like, yeah, we do have to work hard, but it's almost like our identity is tied up in our ability to, to like, prove that we've put in X amount of mm-hmm. hours. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that a lot of musicians, that's why we find ourselves in these places where we can't play anymore because physically our body is like, peace out. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm done. <laughs> so... I yes. remember I remember having a lesson with a, a violist in the LA Phil, <clears throat> and I got done playing like for the first time for him, and he was like, "I can tell you're a really hard worker," and I remember being like, "He gets me," and then he was like, <laughs> "You don't have to work so hard," and I was like, "What?" <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, <laughs> we we really like to hold up that that study, right? Like Malcolm Gladwell had written about it, like the 10,000 hours of practice mm-hmm. makes mm. you a master or whatever. Yeah. And, and even the, the authors of that study have like come back at Malcolm Gladwell and said, no, 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 no. You misinterpreted what we oh, said. No like this really? is, this is not mm. quite exactly like what we were trying to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I, I think that there's definitely uh, a disconnect in there. Um, and I think, I think that disconnect, I know for myself, um, there was a book that I'd read going into my Feldenkrais program that was really pivotal for me. And it was called Art and Fear. Mm. And there's like another subtitle to that, Um, but Art and Fear. And it's like a super short read. It's like Mm -hmm. 50 pages, but it was huge for me because it really shined a light Mm -hmm. on this binary mindset that artists have like oh. we're we're either winning or we're failing right mm-hmm. like we're we either win the audition or we don't or we get into the school we want or we don't or we get applause or we don't or mm-hmm. you know whatever uh and that we're because we're constantly in that mode of thinking black and white we're always afraid of failure like we're mm-hmm. always spinning it towards the negative end because even if I did okay in this, like I hit the shift this time, yeah. what happens next time? I might not hit it next time. Or, you know, I made the, I made, I made it into this music festival this time, but what about next time? I have to work that much harder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. 
Yeah, if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. That's interesting. Yeah. So, and actually, I was, I was, I'm sorry. One oh, thing. No, no, I, no, go I was ahead. gonna um, say, going back to what you were talking about with um, the 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 teacher who <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, the the idea that we're gonna get hurt doing these physical activities. Um, I I feel like I've been more injured injured by playing an instrument in many ways. Like mm-hmm. I, I have experienced more pain playing an instrument than I have doing physical activities. That's not to say you can't get hurt doing the physical activities. Yeah. Um, but it, it really discounts like the intensity of which we use ourselves to play an instrument. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost ironic. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's unfortunate that so many musicians don't understand the mm-hmm. physicality that it takes mm-hmm. to play an instrument. So and a lot yeah. of people and parents just, and teachers. And, yeah. yeah. A lot of yeah. people just don't even try to do sports because they're just, especially in the classical music world, they're kind of just like a hundred percent classical music. And that mm-hmm. also doesn't help. So, well, and then you read certain books like, uh, which one is it? Is it the athletic musician where I think they actually say like, don't do sports. Like in don't... the athletic musician. Really? Yeah. And, and even strength. Tra- I think it's athletic musician. I could be wrong. Um, or maybe it's playing, playing less hurt. It's one of those where it's yeah. like, and, and that's kind of the concept in general. It's like, okay, don't strength train except for doing squats. Like only train your legs. Don't train your arms. Don't train your core. Just do your legs. Wow. And don't play sports. Only swim or, you know, whatever. Um, but there's, there's like, yeah, it's, it's a deep, um, pervasive thought in in our community that's so interesting and the irony of like i think that there's certain exercises that are better for a musician depending on what instrument you play Mm -hmm. because i know that like for example swimming five hours a day when i was in high school and then trying to practice probably was a lot for my shoulders right yeah and cycling is the same if you're spending 20 hours a week bent over Mm -hmm. in this bicycle like this that's Mm -hmm. not going to help because you're (laughs) You know, you're throwing your shoulder around, but would it be that detrimental for someone that's playing piano? I don't know. Probably not, not to the same extent, you know, because you're not in the same positions. So yeah, different. And and what I come back to is that it's not necessarily the what you're doing in terms of swimming or cycling or CrossFit, or Mm -hmm. it's actually how you're doing Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because we get real, there are a lot of people that get real binary in their thinking in terms of like, oh, strength training is bad for musicians, Mm -hmm. or you should only do swimming or, you know, whatever. And that's, that's not helpful either. Mm -hmm. It's like get that kind of prescriptive thinking. Like if you play this instrument, then you need to only do these things (laughs) still is, is, is very limited in, in how, um, how the person can benefit, if well, that makes sense. Yeah, and it's also really interesting because I know that I didn't realize how unaware I was of my body until I started working with, you know, someone who'd majored in kinesiology and he'd trained Olympic athletes and that he just ended up being my personal trainer as well. And after like the first week and he had me do these things that, that were not anywhere close to what I was capable of physically because of the athlete that I was, but... I remember texting him and just being like, I cannot even sit correctly. Like, that's how bad my posture. And he's just like, I don't understand. I was like, I'm trying to do everything you told me. And like, (laughs) I literally can't sit without doing it. (laughs) And of course that, you know, being a perfectionist musician, Mm -hmm. like, it's like, I have to do it right, right now. And, you know, I expected all those things to change. And so it was, it was again, huge for me, like you said, doing it it's not what you're doing, it's how you're doing it. And mm-hmm. I wasn't even walking with good posture. I wasn't sitting with good posture. So yeah. how on earth am I going to ride my bike or play my viola with good posture? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And the posture topic is, is really deep too because mm-hmm. that can get very binary in terms of what sure. is right posture and what is wrong posture and we tend to think of posture as being like static like if i say mm. you need you need to have better posture and then you like <laughs> and you just what stop you, <laughs> you you stop breathing right like yeah. if you if, if, if even if you're reading about posture or you know watching a video about posture like i guarantee anybody listening like to this right now or you is just gonna, hear like, the try and, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're gonna try and sit up in some kind of way that their mother would be proud of or whatever yeah. <laughs> and, and you immediately stop breathing 
And that makes that posture completely unsustainable. Right. And so thinking about posture, you know, in the Feldenkrais method, we think about the posture as a dynamic thing that you mm. can move through. What is your posture in terms of how you can move through space? I like that. Well, can you, since yeah. you just mentioned the Feldenkrais method, can you tell us like what it is? Because I'm sure I don't most people is. haven't yeah. heard of it, including Andrew. Yeah. So no one knows. Nobody knows what it is. It is just, yeah. You talk to a hundred <laughs> practitioners and you're going to get a hundred different answers. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> because it's one of those methods that when you're starting to think about the how of doing, then it becomes very hard to, to to define it as mm. opposed to the what. So, you know, like if you ask what CrossFit is, I can say, oh, okay, well, it's, you know, we're, we're using all these functional movements in this time domain and blah, blah, blah. We do rowing and we do running and we do lift weights and we have kettlebells and blah, blah, blah. Like I can tell you those are things. Feldenkrais is a little harder to grab onto because increase your awareness of how you move. Okay, sorry, um, hold on just a second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Repeat that because we had like a lag and okay. it wasn't clear. Mm-hmm. Okay. You said Which, Feldenkrais is, and Feldenkrais, then it went out. Okay, so Feldenkrais is a little harder to define because we're looking at the how of your movement and how you are moving, how you move yourself. And we're using the movement as a vehicle to gain awareness and insight into how you think and how you sense and how you feel so the movement is just one part so if you go and watch an awareness through movement class which would be a feldenkrais group class it's a verbally guided um, sequence of movements uh, that you would maybe think oh this looks like a lazy person's yoga Like, what are these people even, like, I, there, there were some crossfitters that I used to teach ATM to, and they would be like, oh boy, nap time. Yeah, you're, you know, like, depending on the lesson, you could, it could be very, very tiny movements, you know, like developmental baby stuff. Mm. Um, that's maybe not the most um, sexy or impressive, like handstands and, you know, acrobatics, <laughs> though there are those lessons too in the mm-hmm. method. Uh, but we're, we're looking at, getting better at feeling those how you do that movement so that you can connect to yourself better and improve the maps the movement maps that you have in your brain Mm. you know and and how your nervous system reacts in various situations things like that so So Feldenkrais is the how to movement and basically like how Mm -hmm. this movement and is it something that doctors train themselves in or personal trainers or like in general because I know it's very rare for a musician to mm-hmm. you unfortunately use Feldenkrais but um what when do you normally run into Feldenkrais and why would you want to know more about it yeah so I, I I've heard a lot of practitioners Feldenkrais practitioners say that we're often like the last people that you know, other you know the injured people mm. in pain mm-hmm. come to when we should be the first okay because we're we're not looking to diagnose or intervene but we're looking to improve movement patterns to an awareness your, yeah and awareness to to improve your life and that could be reducing pain that could be improving athletic performance that could be just living better you know if you're an 80 old 80 year old person you're always afraid you're gonna fall um Mm -hmm. learning how to get back up off the floor is really important to you yeah yeah so any person that is having physical pain in movement um in their life could benefit from feldenkrais yeah, I, I, I think that I mean, it's it's hard to make like umbrella, you know, big, big, sure. big generalities. Yeah. But like, I know for myself, like I talk about it in terms of what I experienced, which was chronic repetitive stress pain. Mm. That's, you know, and, and I know that there are practitioners who work with people with Parkinson's um, and you know, other kinds of, of um, uh, issues. But mm. for myself, chronic repetitive stress pain is, is kind of where I... I find myself at home. So can anyone just like take a few classes and then like, is that how they get certified or whatever? 
or so the, the the process to become a trainer yeah or a, excuse me a practitioner so yeah. it's a it's a four-year program actually okay okay um yeah so it's, it's not just like an idea or no, <laughs> no 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 anatomy yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 so there's there's a long it's a pretty okay. long process so it's four years um i was doing my training in eugene oregon um and so you go three times a year uh for like two two week segments okay. um three times a year for four years okay so i think by the end you're accumulating somewhere between like 800 and a thousand hours wow. of, of okay like because you're doing practice. stuff in between those yeah and you're taking classes and reading books and practicing yeah, I know there's some trainings that do that. Um, my training was a little more like you're, you know, self-starting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In terms of like, you know, you guide your own practice. Got it. Uh, but yeah, no, like you're eight, eight hundred to a thousand hours just in class. Okay. Holy yeah. moly, that's a lot yeah. of hours. Yeah, it is. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like to think of it as like it was a second bachelor's. <laughs> yeah. It sounds uh -huh. like it. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, when you're helping someone. Um, mm. do you find that it's necessary for them to meet with you for months at a time? Have you seen clients that benefit from like two or three sessions? What, what is like typical for people to see improvement? That's a good question. Uh, it depends on the person, which I know mm. is like kind of a half-assed answer, but <laughs> it, it really, it really does. Like it depends mm -hmm. on what their situation it is. It depends on what they want to learn. Mm -hmm. um, because the mod modality itself, we might be talking about pain, um, but it's it's about the pain is an er oh, excuse me the method is an educational method. So we're looking to educate people uh, in their awareness as opposed to like in, you know directing them uh, mm -hmm. with some kind of protocol. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, I can't remember I spaced on your question. It's okay. So this, this <laughs> isn't a good method Sorry. for someone that just wants to be given all the answers or like wants yeah. a medication. It, it's yeah. going to take work of the client as well yes. as not just showing up, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's nothing passive about this method. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I think that that's why maybe musicians have a tendency to gravitate a little bit more towards Alexander Technique. Mm. Um, because Alexander Technique, actually Moshe Feldenkrais, the originator of the Feldenkrais method, studied briefly with Alexander. Interesting. And so there, there are some commonalities between the two methods, but Alexander Technique is much more formulaic, like, you know, here's your checkbox. Uh, your checklist um, mm -hmm. of, of the things that make good posture and, and whatnot. Mm. Whereas the Feldenkrais method is much more fluid and experiential in terms of your own learning. Because we often say that your, when your brain, when you find an easier way to move, your brain is going to want to do that. Mm. Like you're not going to have to think about it intentionally uh it's it's just gonna happen and it's it's pretty cool actually how that works like, well it would make sense why you would gravitate toward this type of training if you're someone that doesn't always want to be given that formulaic mm -hmm. so yeah that's mm -hmm. that's really interesting yeah um so i may have already kind of alluded to this and if you don't feel like there's anything new to say about it feel free to just be like, I kind of already answered that, but, um, <laughs> it's, that's only if I remember your question. <laughs> My brain is no working. <laughs> I, I get, I, mom brain is like totally hair. I get it. It is a, it is a real thing. <laughs> um, if you were to give like our listeners, a, uh, some tools about how they could improve their playing via physical avenues, whether it's you know, pursuing something in Feldenkrais, because that's not necessarily physical thinking like going to the gym, but an mm -hmm. awareness of body, I think is still a physical thing. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, as a personal trainer slash CrossFit, if I'm a musician who has never really sought out taking care of my body, how would you recommend getting started? Um, mm -hmm. How much should I be doing? What, what could I do? Yeah. And that's, that's always a big question because I think that part of the, the hesitancy that a lot of musicians have in going into the gym, uh, maybe whether it's to lift weights or, you know, whatever, whatever they think they're going to do or want to do the, 
the hesitancy comes from this lack of a beginner's mindset. Mm. So you've played an instrument mm. for many, many years. Mm. You have this expectation of your skill and you have this expectation of yourself. And I think musicians, we often get into this, I, this mindset that like, we need to be good now. Mm -hmm. Like we've got a gig coming up. I got to learn this piece. I got to be good now. And that's not how it works when you're going into the gym. You have to be open to screwing up. <laughs> and you have to be open to doing way less. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, be open to just doing the bare minimum to learn the skill. You, you kind of have to remember back to the time uh, when you were first learning your instrument. Like, mm -hmm. what was that like? You know, you weren't playing Paganini uh, in your first year of playing the violin, right? Like, that's just not what we do, or most of us yeah. <laughs> do that. And, and if somebody does, they're an outlier. Like, we're not gonna, like, yeah. let's just separate them from the pack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good for them, great for them. I'm happy for you, but the rest of us, it took us many years to get to Baganini. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, like, you can't, you can't walk in and pick up a kettlebell and expect to be doing, like, 100 snatches uh, on, under five minutes with the kettlebell like that's just yeah. not going to happen um and you also i think it's really important to find a trainer somebody to work with who understands uh the need to maybe temper your expectations mm. because i think you know we the, the normal trainer out there is going to push you push you push you and as a musician being pushed we take that to a way further extreme than maybe the normal person coming in off the street definitely well and having like i you can correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like part of that mentality is also having a higher pain threshold like mm -hmm. Someone here who I've literally like run races on a broken foot, or mm -hmm. when you were saying how, about your audition with your neck, I yeah. I played an audition with a broken finger, a piano audition. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. I mean, I was twelve. It was a scholarship audition. It wasn't the end of the world, but we couldn't no. get to the doctor beforehand, and you know, mom was like, "Well, go see what you can do." I was like, "Well, my pinky's not that important, you know, so <laughs> why not?" Yeah, so we absolutely. relivered it. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's uh. It, that's actually what got me to pursue even seeing a trainer is because I had injured myself so many times in sports and in music. And I was like, you know, I feel like I'm actually getting kind of good at the sport and I don't want to get injured. And everyone says that weight training helps you not get injured. And so, mm -hmm. because I also had never pursued weight training because I didn't want to be bulky. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And, and the other thing about a trainer is them understanding like, oh, I can't pump out my arms today because I have to go play a gig tonight. And if I do X, Y, Z, it's not, not going to bode well for yeah. me. So that's, yeah, that having someone there that's in your court to at least get you started, I think would yeah. be very useful. And, and who's, who's open to listening to you? Because yeah, I, I've totally worked out with broken toes before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You don't realize how important those toes are until you're doing burpees. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're trying to uh, run. You're like, uh, yeah. I don't need my pinky toe. I don't oh, need it turns toes out. to run. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I've, I've, I've had coaches um, who would actually yell at me for not wanting to do some part of the CrossFit workout that day because I had a recital to play that night. Like, you know. It's okay. like, I'm sorry, I want to abstain from this right now because I have to play this like, you know, like hour long, hour and a half long recital tonight. So I'm so sorry. I'm not going to do that. I'm like, what? They're like, what? You're just, you're going to stand for an hour so you can't do that. <laughs> Explain that to me. Yeah, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> Good yeah. to know. Okay. Um, so I know that you have, I'm not sure what you call it, but you have a method. Is it called mind felt method? Is that? Yeah. My mind felt methods. Yeah, Can you that's, tell us about that's it? the name of my, my company. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's just kind of my thing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's funny, nobody's really talked, asked me about that before. Um, <laughs> it, it was, you know, I was looking for a name um, to have to represent myself online. And um, uh, yeah, that's, it just kind of came out of like wanting to have that. And so I, you know, I like uh, the mind felt in terms of 
that we're feeling, but we're using our mind, right? Like mm -hmm. the, we have this tendency to separate the mind and the body and mm -hmm. then talk about the mind body connection. And, and it's really kind of a fallacy. Like the, the idea that our minds and our bodies have ever been, you know, like the, the, talking about them being connected means that at some point they were separate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And they've never been separate. Like your mind and your body have always been together. It's like right. you are you. And, you know, sometimes it's helpful to use the word body and it's helpful to use the word mind. Um, but, you know, like we, we get very dependent on separating the body from the mind. So I think, I mean, I think that's a cultural thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I think, I think we're just taught to do yep. that mm -hmm. from, for many different reasons and, Mm -hmm. have many different causes of it as well so well and yes. as musicians we're kind of well i know some people some musicians where they just put their mind to it and i'll just put six hours in the practice room and then that's it i mean they just kind of power through it yeah and they don't consider those things like you said yeah yeah and then they have to do their their body self-care later yeah. right yeah. because <laughs> they've they've powered through this thing they put yeah. their mind to it and it's uh -huh. like well but you know like you actually probably wouldn't really need the self-care so much if you had yeah. um or it's, it's you know i love redefining oh she's paused are you still there <laughs> you're paused for us i think her internet can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. Ah, You're back. Okay. You're <laughs> back. I'm back. Yeah. Sorry. I just got a like unstable internet connection. It's ah, okay. Did it again. Okay. You were frozen. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. That was, <laughs> that was good. That was really good. Oh, um, sorry. Where did I leave off? Or where, what was the last? What was the last word she said? It was, it was a problem because we started talking to try to figure out mm -hmm. what you, yeah. <laughs> where well, you were. So, so I was saying that, um, you know, I love redefining things. Oh, so yes. the idea of self-care, mm -hmm. we have this idea that self-care needs to be a bubble bath and like a candle. <laughs> and Write it, in your journal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Take some time to meditate. And all those things are great. Like not bashing those at all. But what, you know, and there, there's some really cool people talking about this and I love it where it's, you know, what if self-care were actually getting enough sleep yeah. and eating, mm -hmm. <laughs> eating to nourish your, yourself, mm -hmm. um, you know, and maybe stopping practice when you need to, or, you know, being a little bit more efficient in your practice, as opposed to like what I described earlier when I was a kid, you know, like just play through the piece over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Like that's not practice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just kind of insanity. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, so what if, you know, what if we thought about self-care as those things so that after a six hour, you know, session, you're not going to feel like you need to go do all the other stuff. Um, yeah. It's interesting. Cause I, I'd never thought of that before, but it's mm -hmm. true because there's so many things in life that if we compartmentalize them, it doesn't benefit us or our society. And so it's interesting that self-care is one of those things. I mean, mm -hmm. imagine if we're like, okay, I have to check the box for kindness today. So I'm going <laughs> to yeah. say one nice thing to this person and then I'm going to be a horrible person the rest of the day. <laughs> like that. It just like creates awful things. So it's interesting, but you know. People do that. Yeah. People do that. They have like their <laughs> things where they're like, do a nice thing for someone today. And it's like, but what you about know, everybody else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone else yeah. might be sad. <laughs> what about yourself? Like, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So, like, just like taking an approach where you can be more self find different ways of self-care and that doesn't mean you can't take the bubble bath but mm -hmm. it also means that if you don't get a chance to take the bubble bath you didn't necessarily neglect yourself all day yeah. yes so yes exactly yeah. and yeah it can be instead of taking the bubble bath it could be hey i'm only gonna practice for 30 minutes today because mm -hmm. that's that's what i have in me uh, or maybe I'm not going to practice at all. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I've had those days. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Many of yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. And that's okay. Like, I think we have this tendency to like beat ourselves up for not practicing, you know, and mm -hmm. you're not going to lose your skills. You're not going to lose your skills in a day or a week. Like I really haven't played in months and I come back to the violin and it's like the, the fundamentals are there. Like, of course I can clean up some things yeah. if I chose to put in the, the work to practice, but like it's the, the overall skill is there mm -hmm. and it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. So with the mind felt method, it sounds like it's very um, personalized. 
mm-hmm. to each mm-hmm. client. Like, yeah. maybe you would find a client that you really need to talk about the mind part of it and awareness, but perhaps you have another client who has had a lot of experience with that and you might focus more on physical training because you mm-hmm. have that training. So is it kind of a combination of all of these certifications and things that you have? Um, is it more based on Feldenkrais and then it branches out to the other things or what? Yeah, you know, I would say that it's it's based in Feldenkrais and it branches out to the other things. And and the reason that is, is because the, the Feldenkrais method, as I described before, it's it's so much more about the how and mm. and the the lessening of you know like the binary thinking. Like we're not necessarily goal oriented in the Feldenkrais method. Uh, and so finding because there's so many people that like that's really where a lot of the pain and the injury is coming from. And so kind of lessening that grip uh, in that way. And then branching out from well, there. And isn't it true that even just that that uh, mental pressure of that, of not wanting, like, that could even be something that's contributing, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and that was, that was a big, huge uh, shift for myself, actually, mm-hmm. uh, was that the, the times that I was experiencing the, the most amount of pain were times that I was under the most amount of stress. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. you talk about, you talk about, you know, like separating these things, like you, you mentioned with the self-care, um, we tend to do that as musicians. It's like, mm-hmm. we have our lives and then we have our music mm-hmm. and we rarely see that they are, <laughs> they are one Together. and the same. Yeah. Which is yeah. so interesting yeah. because I feel like at least for string players, Suzuki is one of the like, White. top trainings mm-hmm. and that is so against anything that he taught the mm-hmm. whole idea of suzuki is that music is learned just like any other language and it's just a part of you that it comes mm-hmm. so naturally so it's so interesting that even in the string world we've come so far away from that when so many people come from at least that's what sinichi suzuki intended mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. he first started his method you know so interesting yeah i you know i i, I didn't I've never dove, dove in, whatever. I haven't done much with the Suzuki method other than like play through the books when I was a kid. So I'll have to look into that. I'm, That's really fascinating. I'm reading right now his uh, Nurtured with Love. It's the <laughs> first book. If you ever do any kind of Suzuki training, they make you read it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I'm doing at the end of the month. So very cool surprise. Oh, that's um, awesome. I'm gonna look up that book because I also never was a, a I, I played Suzuki books, but I never did the training. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been very uh, eye opening to me. Of mm. I've found that every time I find something about Suzuki, it's actually not what I thought it was. <laughs> so in <laughs> in a so good way, different. in a positive yeah. way, yeah. in a positive yeah. way. You know, I grew yeah. up in Suzuki method is you know, kids that play beautifully and can't read music and, mm-hmm. and, yep, same. Mm-hmm. and there may be some truth to that, but just, you know, like the whole idea of what Sinichi Suzuki wanted and what his vision was, it's, it's very different from, I think what some of it has become. So mm-hmm. it's really interesting, but anyway, that's a huge tangent. I'm sorry, but <laughs> no, I, no, it no. Just, and that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It just made yeah. me think of it because of what we've been talking about. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because I wonder about the development of the books, because the books have given us basically a checklist, right? Yeah. Like, right. You need to know these songs before you go to the next level. Well, yeah. So here's something that's interesting. He told a story in the book about um, two of his students that were very accomplished as 15-year-olds, and the radio station called him, and they wanted him to have t- some of his students perform. And he found out about it months before it happened. And he waited until the day before and told his two students, you are going to go play the Bach double. And he gave them the music and go learn the music. And they went the next day memorized. Wow. That's how high their playing level was. That they, you know, because at that point they were playing Bach Chacon and Mm -hmm. like, like way harder than Bach double. And they never played the Bach double, which is in book four. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So ah. I wonder, I'm still haven't gotten so to the, the secret. What's the, <laughs> well, I still haven't gotten to the point where it got standardized into the books, but okay. he had students that were 15 year olds that had never played Bach double. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So interesting. It was yeah. not formulaic. I think there yeah. are things that are formulaic, but it was not formulaic the way that it is now. we see so mm-hmm. much. 
Yeah, that, that was a huge revelation for me, like in grad school, realizing like, yeah. oh, I don't have to learn every etude in this book. Like, I can, <laughs> I can just pick and choose what I need to learn. Oh, oh wow. this is like, <laughs> right? It's yeah. huge. Yeah. Wait, I can learn just like the first eight bars, like, and, and I still benefit. Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. So I'm just a little curious then. So that the Alexander the Alexander, Alexander technique? technique. Yes, mm-hmm. that is that one. Would you say that's not? Um, that's just like it sounded like you said it was a checklist, and it's not applied to different. Is it more of a string thing? Because I've never heard of it. It's no, it's it, it, I thought um, it... Alexander. So I mean, I'm, full disclosure, I am not an Alexander person. Right. Like, yeah. I, and I, I've, I don't I've... know a huge amount about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, I've seems... taken a couple classes and they weren't very memorable. Um, yeah. So, uh, no, no. but from what I understand, and it sounds like you've done it some. Angela. I've I've heard a couple lectures of it in my undergrad. Mm-hmm. They had oh, specialists yeah. of it come to our school. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Alexander was an actor actually, and okay. he had lost his voice, and so he was trying to he he developed the method out of his own method out of trying to find his voice again. Mm. Um, and so that's, but it's, you know, the, from what I understand, it's very much about carriage of the head and, you know, the activations of certain muscles or whatnot as you're, you're doing things. But, you know, like here, we want you to be in this kind of alignment. Um, mm. to be so able it's to... still a body awareness, but yeah. it's asking less questions yeah. and giving you things to check yes. off. Mm-hmm. What I was kind of asking that. by that was, it seems like the, 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 what is it called? The Flandrix? The... Feldenkrais? Feldenkrais? Yeah. <laughs> Feldenkrais. Was... Was... It's been called worse, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it seems that what I was trying to get to say was that the Feldenkrais was, it's kind of more adapted and different for each person. Yeah. Like you said, kind of. Yeah, so it's in 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 a sense, it's it's a little more customizable. Yeah, because yeah. it's like okay. a kind of almost pick your own adventure. Yeah, <laughs> like because so if I ask you, like if I ask you to um, take a breath in and then let the air out, and then notice where you feel the most movement in that mm. breath, mm-hmm. and notice where you feel the least amount of movement notice that you yawn like Mm -hmm. that's you know that's a thing to notice like and so it's more like here you know try this movement it could be just lifting a pinky Uh, Mm -hmm. it could be the tiniest little movement uh but then what do you notice and so as a practitioner i'm helping you tie the different parts of yourself together okay Okay. so and a lot of it is is um exploring the skeleton actually mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so we o- don't otis we don't... is that his name not uh, otis. Ozzie. 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 i knew it was otis. An, yeah. <laughs> i knew it was an o <laughs> anyway maybe your pillow should be named otis <laughs> yes actually i have a skeleton pillow somewhere i should just I, his name is now otis <laughs> there we go i like yeah. it. for those of you who are listening and i'm not watching the video she has a skeleton in her background that's what we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so. so is there anything else about Feldenkrais or, you know, physicality of playing music or anything that we've discussed today that we haven't, that hasn't come up that you think would be useful for people to, to know? <sighs> you know, I, a thing that I'm, I'm really thinking about a lot lately is how we and and I think that our society kind of does this in general, but as musicians, like we've kind of taken it to the extreme. Um, <laughs> like and, and actually, <laughs> athletes we would athletes never do that. Never. <laughs> <laughs> but athletes actually do it too, where we we start to think that everything we do must be of benefit to your playing. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, so, okay, fine. I'll, I'll take your Feldenkrais class, but how is it going to help my playing (laughs) or fine? Yeah. Okay. I'll lift weights, but how is it going to help my playing? Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, I say that a little more aggressively than most people ask that question. (laughs) However, I get this question, you know, you take somebody through a lesson and they say, okay, this is great. I can turn. I feel great walking around, but how does this help my playing? Like, what am I supposed to do with this? How do I take Mm -hmm. this into playing? And I, I think that we need to start as a community, but just as individuals, looking at ourselves as just human beings 
and that not everything you do has to directly benefit mm -hmm. how you play your instrument. Mm -hmm. Like the indirect benefits of things are huge, but then just improving yourself as a human mm -hmm. is huge. What? It's gonna actually, I mean, even if you're just a, a improving yourself as a human is actually going to affect how you play your yeah. instrument. Absolutely. Right? But we just get so tied up in how how we can be the best musician we can possibly be, but we distance ourselves from like making ourselves more human. Mm -hmm. So this is this is kind of my my like soapbox at the moment is mm -hmm. like, you know, it, it doesn't have to directly improve your playing to make your life better. And in mm -hmm. fact, creativity is one of those things that is going to improve you in general. And I don't mean creativity in terms of like, picking the next piece you're gonna play <laughs> <laughs> that's creative <laughs> yeah. well, or, you know, like, the, the freezing that you're gonna use in your bronze or whatever or, like, i love you know, that you just qualified that like yeah. just to be sure <laughs> that's not for someone creative. that was trying to get around that <laughs> yes <That's funny. laughs> creativity, awesome. creativity does <laughs> creativity does apply to fingerings and slurs and bowings and all those things yes but what i mean is creativity in just exploring your humanness and you know what can you do like what kinds of work can you do with your hands that isn't playing an instrument and you know challenging yourself in in not the ways that like you need to go um uh, and I hate using the word challenge because people start to think like, oh, I need to like muscle into it. Yeah. But yeah. like, you know, <laughs> you know, go go appreciate nature and you know, just get outside and and just do other things. Get away from your instrument because you're not gonna lose that facility. Like I said earlier, like getting away from your instrument for a little bit of time is not gonna hurt your progress as a musician. Mm -hmm. Actually, I. I I guarantee it'll help it. Mm -hmm. uh, this, yeah, this is a topic that has kind of come up uh -huh. on various interviews, and it's really unfortunate that we don't understand exactly what you're saying as musicians because really what people want to listen to is our humanity. Yeah. They want something human to connect with. And so if you're an empty human, Robotic. your performance yeah. is going to be that way too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's huge. I'm so glad that you touched on that, even though... It's not even 100% everything else we've been talking about, yeah. but I guess, mm -hmm. I guess it is mm -hmm. um, connected. Well, so. and, it, and it's that quote that you brought up a few episodes ago with, about um, from Yo-Yo Ma, mm. that he says, I'm first a father or a husband. First time, no, mm. I'm first a human, second a father, third okay. a musician. Yeah. So. I heard him lecture one uh -huh. of the times he came to Santa Barbara because yeah. he's there like every year. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And that Stay was one away. of the things that he said, and I was like... Huh. No wonder people love him. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that really is what he's exuding. Mm. Oh, yeah. But you watch him play, and he's like, you, know, you watch musician. him play Dvorak, whatever, yeah. you know, and he's like <laughs> playing a duet with the oboe. Like, he's literally playing right. a duet with them. He's yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. turned, and like, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the movement that he has is amazing to be able to like turn that way. Like, you ask a lot of cellists, and they're like, you want me to do what? <laughs> <laughs> I <sit>. What? <laughs> <laughs> I face this way. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny well so hearing some of the stuff you've said today also as well just on a i, I guess personal note a lot of what you just said yeah. in this past comment also is very similar to the things i've been reading in the suzuki book so i think you would really enjoy yeah. it um look it up yeah yeah it's it's similar you know he's he had a parent come to him once and said is my child going to amount to anything in violin Ugh. and he's like He's like, I don't answer those questions because I'm not teaching them to make them become exceptional. I'm teaching them to make them a good human, yeah. essentially. Mm -hmm. So, you, again, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. um, Love it. <laughs> yeah, <that's cool. laughs> but um, the last question I have for you, I actually don't think I gave you a heads up on that. I'm so sorry oh about that. Um, <laughs> this, is when we, this is when we like to ask everybody. Uh -huh. So... Um, of all the things you've accomplished in your life, and this doesn't have to be based on your career or anything, but what do you consider to be your greatest accomplishment? Hmm. I mean, of course, there's always the things like having a kid, <laughs> producing my child is my greatest accomplishment. <laughs> and to a certain extent, you know, there, there is that, but more on like the like personal individual level, um, singing actually mm. like becoming a singer i mm. i feel like is 
is a, a huge accomplishment for me because singing, I had a lot of trauma around singing. Mm. Like the, the thought of getting up in front of anyone, whether it was somebody who I knew and I loved um, or it was a crowd, it, it just terrified me to the point of tears. Like mm. thinking about it would just bring me to tears. And, and at a certain point I realized this is not, um, <laughs> this is not based in reality. Like the, mm. the, the fear that I have mm. around this is not something that, um, is me. And so I, you know, I, I started singing with our Irish band and, you know, it was like, at first there was, it, and I was in the Feldenkrais program at this point, but it, it, being able to observe what I was feeling, like mm -hmm. trying to sing, like, oh, the back of my neck is shortening, like here I'm feeling this, you know, I'm feeling these things, uh, and being able to just notice those things. And when you can just notice without any kind of judgment, mm -hmm. those things can change themselves. It's really fascinating mm -hmm. that it just changes. Like you don't have to force a change to happen. And, and when we judge these things, um, change becomes much less likely. Mm. <laughs> so just objectively noticing what you're feeling uh, makes that change possible. And so kind of working through those things and then getting to the point where, you know, being able to go in with a new song and like just mm -hmm. not give any shits <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> about what the outcome is going to be you know with this song like i don't care if it sounds if it goes like you know a train wreck um this is fun <laughs> i'm having mm -hmm. fun right now because i'm enjoying having my own voice right and yeah that's yeah. cool cool and finally um to summarize this it doesn't have to be anything new but what are some tools that musicians can put in their toolbox Tools in their toolbox. So, um, are you talking about like actual physical things, or are you talking about just methodologies or mindsets, or both? How do you mean? Any of those? Any, all any of the above? Uh -huh. okay. um, you know, I think that as as we've kind of talked about before, like today, uh, becoming aware of the binary ness mm -hmm. in your thinking. So, and recognizing fear when you're feeling fear um, and, and just noticing it, like you don't have to do anything about it, but just acknowledging that it's there mm -hmm. is huge. Um, I, you know, I think that's, that's really one of the biggest tools that and breathing, like breathing, especially with string players. Like we have kind of been taught that like breathing is not important for us. Like, oh, you're not, it's not like you're a wind player. <laughs> um, <laughs> or it's not like you're a singer or something like that, that like, you know, somehow we need to be, uh, we don't have to have some kind of conscious, uh, relationship <laughs> with our breath. Um, <laughs> but breathing, like finding some kind of a breath practice. Um, and I would say that it doesn't even matter what the breath practice is. Like there are a lot of different methodologies. I think there's, there's that book breathe or breath or something that just came out. I haven't read it. I don't, I, but everybody's raving about it. Mm. Um, it, it doesn't really matter what practice you pick up because improving your breathing is going to, it, it just is going to change everything for you. Like if you're really, you know, if you're experiencing pain or you have a lot of anxiety, depression, things like that, mm -hmm. just being able to change your breathing is, is really helpful in freeing yourself from a lot of those kinds of traps. Um, so yeah, even awesome. just taking yeah. the time to sit down and breathe in for four, breathe out for four, a couple rounds, you know, mm -hmm. it's yeah. huge. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been Thanks. Great to talk to you. This has been awesome. Yeah. Thank you for making the time for it. Yeah. I know it's oh. been a crazy week. Um, <laughs> but yeah, very we really, crazy. We've really appreciated you yes. making the time for us. So. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It was so good to see you again, Angela. It's nice to meet you, Andrew. Yeah. Absolutely. Nice to meet you. What a great interview. Thank you so much for listening and watching. And we truly hope that you have found some tools to put in your toolbox. Our podcast, as a reminder, can be found on various platforms as well as on YouTube. 
Once again, feel free to send us a DM or voice message with anything that you'd like to see in the future. Um, we often post announcements and upcoming guests on our social media, so if that's interesting to you, you should go and give us a follow. Yeah, we would love some follows. And lastly, while we do love doing this for free, podcasting is not free. So if you really like what we're doing and have uh, gained some value from our show, there are a few ways that you can support us. You could share with your friends. You could rate and review. And subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You could also shop our merch, uh, which you might have seen in our YouTube videos, or become a supporter through a donation at the Anchor Podcast link in the show notes below. Thanks for watching. See you later.